Moving on to the next segment of, um, of the afternoon, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Conrad M. Riley Endowed Professor Lecture. Uh, and um, after this, we'll have a reception and five-year celebration up on the bridge. Now, Conrad M. Riley uh, was a versatile pediatrician uh, who, back in 1949, helped describe Riley Day syndrome, a rare genetic disorder in childhood that harms the nervous system and, and often leads to, to early death. Uh, and this is a picture of, of Dr. Riley on the slide here. Um, he was recruited to come to Colorado in 1960. Uh, to the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He was chairman of the Department of Preventive Medicine from 1961 to 1966. During that time, he continued to practice as a pediatrician. He um, at, served as an associate dean of the School of Medicine and a member of the Health Sciences Ethics Committee. Uh, he argued um, vocally for liberalizing Colorado's abortion laws and for increasing the number of women and minority members accepted to the medical school during his career. And he was also involved in the community outside the, the School of Medicine. Um, he was president of the Denver Zoo's Board of Trustees for a period. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree from Yale and his medical degree from Harvard, so pretty good uh, credentials there. Um, and born in Worcester, Mass., uh, he died here at the University of Colorado Hospital in July 2005 at the, at the age of 91. So um, obviously also good living. In his estate, Dr. Riley established uh, this fund, the Conrad M. Riley, MD, uh, Endowed Professor Fund, uh, and said that he was doing this in some ways to honor the memory of his grandfather, Mil Milton Prince Higgins. Uh, who was known as MPH to his friends. I find that um, one of the, uh, another one of the strange coincidences. He was known as MPH, and we know why that's funny here. Uh, so MPH was a successful businessman during the turn of the 20th century and was a strong advocate for education. He died a year before uh, Conrad Riley was born, and his legacy enabled Dr. Riley to, in to create this endowment fund. Uh, so at this point, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you the inaugural Conrad M. Riley Endowed Professor, Dr. Donna DeBilia. Uh, as Professor of Epidemiology, Dr. DeBilia is one of our school's strongest researchers, having generated over $25 million in research funding since joining CU in 2006. Uh, she serves as the principal investigator for multiple studies. I'll just mention a couple, the Search for Diabetes Study, uh, for which she is also the national study co-chair. SEARCH is a multi-center study funded by the CDC and the NIDDK to investigate the causes and outcomes of um, uh, diabetes in U.S. children. She's also PI of the EPIC study, in which she's exploring perinatal outcomes related to maternal diabetes, uh, and the Healthy Start study, a pre-birth cohort study, exploring the association of maternal obesity with perinatal and early childhood metabolic outcomes. Uh, she has at least 145 publications listed in PubMed from a search I did earlier this week and has been cited over 4,300 times in the medical literature according to the Web of Science search I did earlier this week. Uh, both of those um, very admirable uh, numbers indicating she's making a major impact on the scientific community through her research. In addition, uh, she's an uh, active contributor to the school's education mission, teaching both uh, master's and doctoral level students and she previously served as the director of the Epidemiology, MS, and PhD programs. She earned her medical degree and PhD from the University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Timisoara, Transylvania, Romania, uh, where she also completed residencies in internal medicine and diabetes and metabolic diseases. Following that training, she completed a research fellowship in diabetes epidemiology at the NIDDK facility in Phoenix. Uh, and so uh, with no further ado, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce Donna as the Conrad M. Riley, MD, Endowed Professor at the Colorado School of Public Health. She'll present on the early life origins of pediatric obesity and diabetes. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. DeBilia. So I wanted to thank you, David, for um, 
awarding me this title. Um, I want to especially thank the faculty of the Colorado School of Public, Public Health for the incredible commitment um, to working together and bringing, up, bringing us from where we were five year, years ago to where we are today, this incredible diversity of research that we've heard about uh, throughout the day. And I'd like to thank especially the faculty and students of the Department of Epidemiology who welcomed me uh, many years ago in 2001, straight from Romania, who um, mentored me, supported my uh, professional development, uh, and uh, were my friends. So um, thank you very much. My talk today is going to be about the developmental overnutrition and pediatric obesity and type 2 diabetes. And I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of, of an epidemiologist that works with a lot of uh, other types of scientists, basic, basic scientists, public health researchers, to try to find out how we can prevent uh, obesity and, and type 2 diabetes in children. But why am I saying developmental overnutrition? So over the last four decades, we have seen an incredible increase in the prevalence of obesity, overweight and obesity in children and adolescents um, in the United States, um, both in older adolescents and younger children. And we've seen a younger age at onset of obesity now even among infants. So there are articles in, in um, the non-medical literature about the chunky babies that are being born these days and whether they are healthy or not. Now, obesity in children does not, does not remain without consequences, and the search for diabetes in youth study has recently demonstrated that what, you, what used to be called adult onset diabetes is now present in children and adolescents of all racial ethnic groups. These are data from the search study showing uh, that type 2 diabetes is an extremely prevalent condition in all racial ethnic groups, 50 per 100,000 per year uh, of American Indian children now have type 2 diabetes or develop type 2 diabetes. But type 2 diabetes is also present in, in Caucasian children. So all this suggests that um, risk factors for these conditions uh, have origins very early in life, maybe during the intrauterine period or early postnatal life. So that's why we're talking about what we're talking today. And in the, at the, in the early 1990s, uh, the late now David Barker, he passed away two weeks ago, uh, coined the now famous fetal origins hypothesis um, that really postulates that fetal life is a critical period when an exposure may have lifelong effects on the structure or functions of organs, tissues, and body systems. But even before Barker, um, Scandinavian scientists or um, American scientists like Nor Norbert Frankel coined another term that um, was called at the time fuel-mediated teratogenesis. And uh, according to uh, Frankel, intrauterine exposure of the fetus of women with diabetes during pregnancy to an excess of fuels, for example, glucose, causes permanent changes leading to greater birth weight, but also a long-term, lifelong increased risk of development of obesity and type 2 diabetes. At the time, this was uh, an isolated hypothesis having to do only with gestational diabetes or diabetes during pregnancy. Now it has been expanded, and it has been renamed the fetal overnutrition hypothesis to highlight the fact that perhaps not just glucose, but a lot of other fuels that are elevated in diabetic and obese pregnancies might program a lifelong risk of obesity and diabetes. And even more recently, uh, this has changed again, and now we're talking about developmental overnutrition to recognize this fact that overnutrition can happen not only during pregnancy, but also after birth. The programming continues, and perhaps the obesity epidemic can accelerate through successive generations independent of further genetic or environmental factors. So let's see a few epidemiologic evidence uh, in support of these hypotheses. Effects on childhood obesity. This goes back to uh, a paper from the famous Pima Indian study, at least it's famous in the literature on, on diabetes and obesity. 
Um, in this study, Dave Pettit and his collaborators have looked at the prevalence of obesity in Pima Indians by uh, age and by their mother's diabetes status during pregnancy. And as you can see here, they compared the prevalence of obesity in offspring of diabetic mothers, shown in yellow, mothers who had diabetes at the time of pregnancy, versus offspring of mothers who were pre-diabetic, did not have diabetes at the time of that pregnancy, but developed diabetes later on, and offspring of mothers who never developed diabetes. In most of these age groups, the prevalence of obesity is much higher in, offspring, in the offspring of diabetic mothers. And even the difference between BMI in offspring of pre-diabetic and, and non-diabetic mothers, although it exists, is much more limited than the difference seen with the offspring of diabetic mothers, suggesting perhaps that these effects of exposure to maternal diabetes in utero are above and beyond genetic susceptibility to obesity inherited from us, uh, by offspring from mothers. The other thing that you can see here is that, at least in this population, you can mostly see this effect early in life. Now, this is a population with a very high risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes, and therefore, late in later life, almost everybody is obese. You can hardly see these differences, but earlier, during childhood and adolescence, is the time period when you can see these effects. And early onset of, of obesity leads to a lifetime increased risk of chronic complications, so it matters. Now, is this true in other populations? A lot of studies have followed the original studies from the Pima Indians, but um, conclusions were less or more consistent. We have looked recently in the study here in Colorado that David mentioned, the EPOC study, exploring perinatal outcomes in children um, with Tessa Crum, one of our colleagues in epidemiology. We looked at exposure to diabetes in utero and childhood adiposity in Colorado children. This was a, a multi-ethnic sample of white, Hispanic, and um, non-Hispanic uh, and African-American children who were exposed and not exposed to maternal gestational diabetes in utero. And we've looked at body mass index in these children, waist circumference, sa um, subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue by MRI. And for all these outcomes, we saw significant and clinically important differences between exposed and non-exposed offspring. Now, the question was, okay, what happens if you adjust for maternal obesity, for maternal pre-pregnant BMI? Um, as you can see, adjustment for maternal pre-pregnant BMI attenuates most of these associations, although some still remain significant. Controlling for maternal pre-pregnant BMI is an attempt to perhaps control for that genetic susceptibility. Um, but on the other hand, controlling for maternal BMI, you control for one of the factors that are potentially in the causal pathway. Um, therefore, I think that sometimes controlling for pre-pregnant BMI in this uh, uh, type of analysis might be a little bit of an over-adjustment. What about effects on childhood type 2 diabetes? We're going back to the Pima Indian study for a second, and um, what we're looking here is a study that I've done when I was a um, research associate postdoctoral fellow there. Uh, prevalence of type 2 diabetes in Pima Indian children by age and by exposure to diabetes in utero. As you can see, the prevalence is much higher in children who are exposed than in those who are not exposed. Uh, type 2 diabetes almost exclusively happened in those children who were exposed to maternal diabetes in utero for an odds ratio of 10, a very strong epidemiologic association. Criticism continued. Well, this is a very obese population. You're not going to see these associations in another population. That's why we looked in another population. And this is the only replication of the Pima Indian study. The search case control study was recently able to look at the same thing from a case control perspective, exposure to diabetes in utero in adolescents from um, Colorado and South Carolina with and without type 2 diabetes. And we had non-Hispanic whites, Hispanics, and African Americans. And in the, each of these groups, exposure to type two, uh, to diabetes in utero was more prevalent in cases versus controls. 
for an uh, adjusted odds ratio of 7.3 with confidence limits that span the value in the Pima Indians. So this association is true in high risk and low risk, lower, lower risk populations. Of course, the most important question is, are these really some specific intrauterine effects or are all these associations due to genetic susceptibility or um, shared familial uh, behavioral factors? And I think that animal studies have provided very strong evidence for specific intrauterine effects, but, but in epidemiology we like to have replication in human studies. So, I can say that based on the available work so far, these associations are in addition of, uh, to genetic predisposition. Here's what we did. In the Pima Indian study, we were able to select siblings um, born before and after their mother developed type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes and examined them at the same or similar ages. So this shows the mean BMI by age in Pima Indian siblings exposed and not exposed to maternal diabetes in utero, born before or after their mother developed diabetes. And as you can see here, with perhaps the exception of the youngest age group, the BMI is higher in the sibling that was born before exposed to maternal diabetes in utero as compared to the sibling that was born, uh, that was born after exposed to maternal diabetes in utero than in the sibling that was born before. So this analysis, the sip pair analysis, isolates um, the specific intrauterine effects by controlling as much as possible in epidemiology uh, for, um, for the genetic associations and for shared familial factors. We did the same analysis now for, um, with Pima Indian sip pairs, the scordon for diabetes and exposure to diabetes in utero. On the left side of the slides, we identified 28 pairs of siblings born before or after their mother developed diabetes. And in 21 of the 28 pairs, the sibling with diabetes um, was born after maternal diagnosis of diabetes. And only in seven pairs, the sibling was born before for an odds ratio that this time really isolates out or controls for genetic uh, factors, an odds ratio of three, highly significant. And on the right side of the slides, the same analysis done in sip bears born before and after their father was diagnosed with uh, diabetes. We did not see a significant association suggesting that these are not um, um, effects due to chain, uh, chance or birth order. The next big question now that we know we have strong associations, we know that there are specific intrauterine effects operating is what are the mechanisms? And here is where I think that my research is going in the next years um, to try to, to determine some of the, really the mechanisms responsible for the, these associations. So it all started with uh, fuel mediated teratogenesis. So what are the maternal fuels that are operating here. The first candidate is obviously glucose. And this is an elegant study from Teresa Hillier at um, Kaiser Permanente Northwestern. Um, she looked using medical record data at prevalence of and risk of childhood obesity by maternal glucose levels. So these are maternal uh, quartiles of maternal glucose levels during the um, um, screening oral glucose tol tolerance tests that is conducted in pregnancy to screen for gestational diabetes. And the higher the glucose levels, the higher the prevalence of overweight in children and obesity in children, and the higher the odds um, for developing uh, overweight or obesity. So it, a dose response effect. Of note here, these are glucose levels that are within the normal range. So these women would not even progress to the second oral glucose tolerance test during pregnancy to be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And we're still seeing a dose, effect, a dose response association. So glucose is certainly a factor. What about other fuels? Um, I uh, didn't mention that uh, the reason glucose is suspected as being one of the 
obvious uh, mechanisms is that glucose crosses the placenta from the mother to the fetus, and um, insulin does not. And so the fetus responds to this heavy load of glucose by producing insulin, so hyperinsulinemia is uh, a risk, um, growth factor, so it promotes growth. Even in utero, these babies are usually macrosomic, but it also can do a lot of long-term uh, effects in terms of uh, risk for uh, obesity later on. However, more recent data from our colleagues from basic, uh, basic uh, science uh, have shown that lipids also cross the placenta, especially free fatty acids. And these are data, if you see them, um, from um, Ute Schaeffer graf from Berlin, who has looked at the correlation between free fatty acids in maternal blood, maternal levels of free fatty acids, and abdominal circumference um, at study entry, abdominal circumference of the newborn, a neonatal fat mass, and free fatty acids in cord blood. And these are all positive and significant correlations. Now, there is no study yet that has looked at maternal free fatty acids during pregnancy and current uh, childhood adiposity um, phenotypes. Uh, hopefully, a uh, healthy start at some point in time will be able to do that. But obviously, f free fatty acids and lipids are another uh, uh, fuel of interest. And another mechanism that uh, has received a lot of attention lately is um, um, epigenetics or DNA methylation. And uh, we were able in the EPOC study with uh, additional small funding from the CCTSI, Nancy West's work here, to look at DNA methylation according to exposure to diabetes in utero. Unfortunately, this was a small study and blood was collected at current age, not cord blood. But still, we did a genome-wide analysis here uh, for epigenetic changes, and uh, these are the top DNA differentially methylated um, regions, uh, and some of them are in genes that are associated with uh, cardiometabolic traits. So this work has to continue, and there are several other things we need to do here before this is strong evidence of a what people call um, an uh, epigenetic signature of gestational diabetes or DNA methylation signature. Why do we, we care about all these things? Why are they important for us as, as um, public health um, practitioners and epidemiologists? I think they're important because of the public health consequences of what we're seeing today. Um, so the Pima Indian study was the first to document an increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in children over a three-decade time period, um, shown here. The same study was able to demonstrate a relationship between an increasing time trend in the exposure to um, diabetes in utero on left from 2% to 8%, and the corresponding increase in the attributable risk for type 2 diabetes in children in that population, from 20% in the 60s to 40% in the 80s. So this just shows that in parallel with an increasing exposure in that population, the attributable risk for type 2 diabetes in that population doubled. And this is the population with the highest prevalence and incidence of type 2 diabetes in the world. Is this true in other populations? Again, we were able to do something similar in the case, search case control study more recently. And what we did here was to look at the proportion of type 2 diabetes in youth attributable to in utero exposure to maternal diabetes and obesity. So we isolated here four mutually exclusive um, exposure categories. One is our reference group, not exposed to either maternal diabetes or obesity. Um, the others are shown here. Um, exposed to maternal diabetes only, very few people, strong association, population attributable fraction, relatively small, 4.7%. Exposed to maternal obesity only, more people, strong association, higher population attributable fraction. And then exposed to both diabetes and obesity, um, a lot of people, a lot of cases, not many controls, extremely strong association, explain 22.8% of type 2 diabetes in children. 
So if you sum up these population attributable fractions, it looks like, if we are to be, believe these data, it looks like exposure to um, diabetes and obesity in utero explains almost 50% of type 2 diabetes in contemporary multi-ethnic children, which is why we think this is an important public health pro problem. So really what happens is uh, that this vicious cycle um, develops, that, that, that is happening in the life course of an individual, but it could also become transgenerational, especially if epigenetic mechanisms are at work that can be transmitted from one generation to another. You start with maternal obesity and diabetes, uh, uh, exposure that is growing. Um, this results in fetal overnutrition, which will lead to an adolescent um, with uh, obesity or early onset type 2 diabetes and perpetuate the cycle, especially if this person is a girl. However, I've shown signs of inputs here from postnatal life because I think that this transgenerational vicious cycle is not self-contained, but there are inputs from outside, especially postnatal overnutrition early in life. Do we have evidence for this? Well, first bit of evidence uh, also comes from the EPOC study work from Tessa Crum. We were curious. We wanted to see how growth, BMI growth trajectories look like in, in offspring exposed and not exposed to diabetes in euro. Um, and given that this is a retrospective or historical perspective cohort, we were able to retrieve um, weight, length, and height for all these children from medical records throughout the entire childhood and adolescence period. So we'll build, we built this growth trajectories, and uh, these are just showing BMI trajectories from birth to age two when we used length instead of height, because these kids don't stand. So what we saw here was that exposed offspring start a little heavier than those not exposed, but then the average, average BMI and the average BMI uh, trajectories are not significantly different. And even the period-specific BMI trajectories that we looked at are not significantly different. So the effect of exposure in euro to overnutrition doesn't seem to appear that early in life. However, when we extended and looked at uh, the growth trajectories from 3 to 13 years of age, the trajectories diverged, the average BMI was different, the overall BMI trajectory was different, and especially after the age of 10 years when these kids enter puberty. So we thought this is a, a very nice example of biological interaction between two um, uh, de de developmentally susceptible f periods for obesity, intrauterine life, life and um, puberty, which motivated us to write a new grant to propose to the NIH to continue the study, which they accepted to do. <laughs> Postnatal nutrition per se. Now we all know that breastfeeding is beneficial for prevention of obesity. Uh, at least there are many observational studies showing that, a little bit less in terms of clinical trial evidence. Uh, 13 to 22 reduction in risk of childhood obesity um, um, for those breastfed versus not breastfed, a 4% reduction for every additional month of breastfeeding, and slower grow a period specific period. And luckily, uh, breastfeeding has been increasing in the United States, uh, which is good. Um, Still based on EPOC data, we were able to look at the effects of uh, breastfeeding and, and this parenthesis. We calculated here, TESA developed specifically for the study uh, um, a variable that was mentioned earlier today, breast milk months, um, uh, that, comprise, that, 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 that accounts both for uh, exclusivity and duration of breastfeeding, and then we categorized it as less than six breast milk months, more than six breast milk months, because this is the recommended amount of time by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we looked here at differences in childhood BMI at selected percentiles by breastfeeding status, adequate versus not adequate. 
And what we saw was that breastfeeding, adequate breastfeeding, rather than reducing the entire distribution of BMI, selectively influences the extremes of these, this distribution, such as that it lowers BMI at the upper end of the BMI distribution, and it increases BMI at the lower end of the distribution, um, shifting the distribution somehow, uh, somewhat towards the mean. And we saw this not only with BMI, but also with waist circumference, with visceral fat, and with um, subcutaneous uh, adipose tissue. Moreover, breastfeeding has been shown to be protective against development, development of pediatric type 2 diabetes in the Pima Indians. Here we show um, work from Dave Pettit on the, prevalen on, on the prevalence of pr proportion with diabetes at various ages by whether they were exclusively breastfed for two months or bottle fed. Um, an adjusted odds ratio, extremely protective. And of course, we replicated this in the search case control study, uh, and we saw the same associations in African American, Hispanic, and non Hispanic white children, a very comparable effect size as well. Um, this led to our next question. It, if breastfeeding protects against obesity, can breastfeeding be used perhaps as an intervention to uh, reduce the risk of obesity in offspring who? were uh, products of um, diabetic or obese pregnancies. So back to the EPOC study, we tried to address this question in EPOC, whether breastfeeding modifies the effect of exposure to diabetes in utero. We looked at the same four outcomes, BMI, waist circumference, uh, visceral and subcutaneous adipose tissue. And the comparison here is, again, between those exposed to diabetes in euro in red and those not exposed in yellow. But this time we stratified by this adequate versus inadequate breast milk months. In those with uh, less than six breast milk month equiv equivalents, uh, exposure to diabetes in utero was associated with significantly higher adiposity markers. However, in those who were breastfed adequately, this difference was attenuated and no longer statistically significant. This reinforces the idea that programming continues outside the intrauterine life, during the early postnatal life at least, and it also provides perhaps um, an avenue for future interventions in these um, high-risk children. So what we've learned so far, we've learned that fetal overnutrition results in increased risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes, especially in children and adolescents. Uh, we have evidence that these associations are above and beyond genetics. We're starting to think about potential mechanisms, the role of maternal fuels, the role of epigenetics. We know that th this overnutrition in utero may account to up to 50% of type 2 diabetes in youth, which is a novel condition, and may trigger transgenerational, uh, transgenerational vicious cycle of obesity and diabetes. We also know that postnatal life modifies long-term consequences of fetal overnutrition. Risks are amplified during other obesogenic periods, and breastfeeding may reduce risks. So what should we do next? I think we should collaborate more with our colleagues from um, medicine and basic sciences to develop an improved understanding of mechanisms. We need animal studies with uh, fast translation to humans, and to be able to translate them to humans, we need large cohorts. Um, for example, we need to learn more about the role of fuels on fetal target tissues, appetite regulation in exposed offspring, and the role of epigenetics. I think a very important uh, future direction for which, this is nice, <laughs> for which uh, uh, I think us epidemiologists might play a major role is to um, understand better the interaction between the early life or the intrauterine life and the postnatal life by uh, building, developing large longitudinal pre-birth cohort studies. We were hoping that the National Children's Study was going to be one of those studies. It might still be, but in, in our uh, wait for that to happen, we should do something here in Colorado. And, and one of these studies is, is Healthy Start. It's very hard to do such a study and, and have information 
throughout the life course starting in pregnancy. But I think we may want to consider a Colorado cohort or something larger where we can study associations, mechanisms, uh, behavioral factors, um, socioeconomic factors. And then we need effective interventions uh, tested through randomized clinical trials prior or during pregnancy. Um, Right now, there is no really no clinical trial to address this issue. Um, there is one paper that is a follow-up to a randomized clinical trial um, of glucose control during pregnancy based on an Australia, Australian population that Matt Gelman published, um, and, and this study was negative. Um, glucose control of mild GDM did not improve obesity in, in children. There are a variety of reasons why the results might have been negative, um, many more than just the one I'm going to mention, but one of them could be that uh, we not only need to control glucose, we may need to control other fuels elevated in obese pregnancies in, by, by, by interventions that address gestational weight gain. And it's not easy because there isn't an intervention. The curriculum for a lifestyle intervention during pregnancy has not been developed. We tried to do that with Jim Hill's group. We were not funded, um, although the grant was well received. But, but you know, here you, you're not aiming at weight loss. You're still aiming at, at some amount of weight gain that is beneficial, yet not harmful. Um, so this is a, a, a very important future direction. And then we need clinical trials to perhaps um, uh, identify interventions during early life that, that would target early life nutrition, promote, say, breastfeeding in high-risk uh, infants uh, to see if uh, they uh, reduce obesity uh, later in life. Uh, again, such a trial does not exist so far, so uh, there are many, many possibilities for uh, future research and development of programs that, that can be applied to larger communities. So thank you very much again for um, this title. And uh, if you want to ask questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, Curtis. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Zellia, uh, offspring exposure to diabetes has been known to be associated with childhood obesity a little bit longer than the other But we're seeing a level off of at least a plateau uh, to childhood obesity that's been attributed to maybe reduction in sugary drinks or something. Do you think maybe the knowledge also of the programming could be? Uh, I think you heard a question. I, I doubt that the uh, plateau in childhood obesity is due to um, knowledge of these programming mechanisms. I think that if there is indeed a plateau, it's, it's been recent, so we don't know exactly if it's going to continue or not. If there is a plateau, it might be due to whatever um, messages are there about this country having a lot of obesity in children rather than knowledge of fetal programming. No, knowledge of fetal programming is, is hard to deliver to the public because on one hand it's needed, um, it's, it's needed to, to talk to pregnant mothers about the fact that whatever they're doing during pregnancy might not just influence themselves but their offspring and the next generation. But on the other hand, sometimes uh, it's a difficult message to deliver because um, the sense of perhaps some mothers are blaming themselves. Um, so you're not just blaming the mom, uh, but trying to improve the intrauterine environment without blaming the mom. It, it's a difficult message to convey. So uh, I think we need more dissemination of the effects of, of uh, intrauterine programming in a, in a way that, that reaches the population in a constructive way, <laughs> not of blaming mothers for what happens to their children. Talia. Uh, 
Well, not uh, beneficial, but the, the beneficial aspect is always the reverse <laughs> of the harmful. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of evidence for uh, a lot of other chronic disease. Well, some of them are associated with obesity, but, but cardiovascular disease, hypertension, um, you know, this programming by exposures during nutritional and, and uh, chemical exposure during pregnancy can affect development of organs, nephrons, heart. Um, so there, there are studies that have shown associations and studies that have looked at mechanisms. Um, and it's not only uh, over, fetal overnutrition that is operating. There, um, we've we've uh, developed a study with John Adgate, who I think just left, to look at um, uh, endocrine disruptor chemical exposure during pregnancy that might affect um, Pro, or might, might have programming effects uh, outside the overnutrition link um, through affecting um, a variety of tissues and systems. And obviously there is a huge literature on, on fetal undernutrition, especially from developing countries, that link fetal undernutrition or selective uh, nutrients during pregnancy to later life outcomes. So benefits are the op opposite of uh, harmful effects. So. In that context, I think that's how I'm answering your question. Yeah. Right, there are studies outside uh, the United States uh, addressing, I think, this very issue. I know the uh, pre-birth cohort in India, the Pune Indian study that is looking exactly at these things. But exactly based on what you've noted or observed um, about this fast transition in, in developing countries, this has led to another um, hypothesis. This field is full of hypotheses that need to be uh, tested. Um, which is called the mismatch hypotheses or the predictive adaptive response hypotheses by which uh, the highest risk of, of chronic disease, obesity and other chronic diseases seen in, in populations that um, uh, were undernourished during pregnancy, during the fetal life, but rapidly after that experienced an environment for which their intrauterine development did not prepare. Uh, so that, that reflects the fast transition, and that's the mismatch hypothesis that is being tested currently. So I'm going to take the prerogative of the last question. You know, Dr. Bates, talk to us about how this relates to uh, PC and childhood, diabetes and childhood, and also to a certain extent, high blood pressure and subcutaneous childhood. All these things are also related to cognitive function. I wonder whether we know much about uh, the effects of this uh, yeah, I think we know more than I do. Uh, <laughs> um, at least the older Pima Indian studies have uh, certainly looked at cognitive function in children as one of their outcomes and have seen differences in um, performance in school and things like that in those exposed versus unexposed to diabetes in pregnancy. And there is a large literature there about this. So. The, that's another outcome yeah, yeah, of interest. Yeah. Uh, indicating the importance of this. Well, again, I want to invite everyone to uh, go up to the celebration on the bridge. Please join me in thanking and congratulating Dr. Pavilion. And also, please join me in thanking once again Tim Byers and Nikki Simino, who made uh, this, who organized today and made this day possible, as well as thanking all the chairs and faculty who came out and, and showcased the wonderful research that's going on uh, at the Colorado School of Public Health. Thank you all.